Hello class and welcome to the week 7 lecture for Introduction to Law. This week we will be covering the Law of Contracts and the Law Governing Business Organizations. Uh, and this material is found in chapters 13 and 14 of your text. Let's begin with a discussion of contract law. Contract law is based on the principle that people should be secure in the knowledge that promises will be honored and are legally enforceable. And the leading authorities on contract law have defined a contractual agreement as a legally enforceable and voluntary promise exchanged by two or more parties to provide the terms of the promise in exchange for something of value known as consideration. And you can see in this slide some of these elements that make up this definition and what must be shown in order to prove a valid contract. Essentially, this means that if parties make a promise or promises to one another, those parties are obligated to perform or complete the terms of that promise. Consequently, in the event a party fails to complete the obligations of a promise, the party who is injured by not receiving that to which he or she is entitled by the promise will have a recourse in the courts against the party who broke the promise. And every valid contract has certain characteristics. And so, to break down those characteristics, these contracts must involve at least two parties, and the parties must have legal capacity. There must be a manifestation of assent by all parties to the contract, and there must be consideration that supports a legal and enforceable promise. The at least two parties element means that a person cannot enter into a contractual agreement with themselves. This rule has traditionally been that a person with an ownership interest in a business, for example, cannot contract as a separate entity to render services that are part of the primary purpose of the business. The next element is legal capacity. An adult, uh, a party that enters into a contract must be an adult or over the age of 18 and must be shown to be mentally content, uh, competent. This means that there cannot be a previous adjudication of disability based on the mental status. Age has some peculiar rules about whether or not the contract will be enforceable. A question may arise, for example, if there is a dispute as to the state whose law will govern the contract. Today, most standard written contracts indicate in terms of the law of the state that will apply in the event of a contractual dispute. Generally, the law is that only adjudicated incompetence lack capacity. Most individuals are given a minimal amount of responsibility to avoid contracting with someone who is obviously mentally challenged to the degree that the person's ability to complete the contract is in question. Traditionally, if a person with capacity enters into a contract with a person without capacity, the person without capacity could choose whether to complete the terms of the contract. This means that the contract is voidable, not void. So if you enter into a contract with somebody that lacks capacity, whether that be because of age or because they have been adjudicated incompetent, the contract is not automatically void. What happens is the other party to be bound, one that has the lack of capacity, may choose whether to either affirm the contract and thus agree to be bound by it or disaffirm the contract, in which case the person that contracted with them is out of luck except that that person may be entitled to restitution for any benefit conferred to the party lacking capacity. The third element is assent, which is a requirement to manifest or demonstrate a willingness to be bound by the contract. And whether or not someone has manifested assent to a contract is measured by an objective standard. An objective standard means that the third party observing the transaction would perceive that the parties agreed to the terms of the contract and intended to be legally bound by those terms. Essentially what this inquiry will be is whether or not a reasonable person would understand that a contract was entered into. It does not matter in this standard then whether the subjective intent of one of the parties is that they didn't mean to be bound by the contract as long as that it would be understood by a reasonable observer that a contract had in fact been created. The following are some situations where assent will not be found. These include agreements made in jest or in jokes, negotiations before the creation of an actual contract, or promises for which a person is legally obligated to do. Uh, 
Now we need to discuss the elements of assent. The first definition that I will provide here is an offer. The party who creates an opportunity to be bound by a contract as opposed to negotiation is the offerer. The party who accepts the offer is the offeree. The acceptance is the last step in the formation of a valid contract, assuming the subject of the contract constitutes appropriate consideration. If the offerer makes a promise, and by that promise it induces the offeree to make a return promise, then a bilateral contract has been created. Each party craves a promise in exchange for the other person's promise. Completion of what is promised by each party will complete the contract. A unilateral contract is created when a promise is made in exchange for actual performance, without first making a promise of that performance. The distinction here is what kind of consideration is offered in return. In a bilateral promise, you could have a situation where the offerer says, I will pay you, I promise to pay you $100 if you will promise to paint my house. That would create a bilateral contract because they've both given return promises. In a unilateral contract, the situation will be something more akin to, if my house gets painted, I will pay $100 to whoever does it. In this case, there isn't a promise to paint the house that's being asked for. The only way that this promise can be accepted is by an actual performance of painting the house. This distinction may seem small, but it can be critical in some cases. Mere negotiations cease at the point in which one party makes a sufficiently detailed offer that can become the basis of a contract. And when one party has actually made an offer, the other party can accept or reject the offer for as long as it is in effect. One thing to note about unilateral contracts, in the common law, it used to be the rule that since what was being exchanged or sought by the offerer was actual performance, that could not be accepted until such performance was completed, that the offerer could rescind or revoke the offer at any time before performance had actually been completed. The modern trend, however, states that if the offeree begins performance, the law will imply an option contract that prevents the offerer from revoking the offer during performance by the offeree. Going back to our unilateral contract example of the painting of the house, this prevents the offerer from revoking that offer when the offeree has begun to paint the house. Finally, it should be noted that the offerer is typically considered the master of his offer. That means he will have a right to revoke it ordinarily at any time before the offeree accepts the offer. And this offer may terminate uh, if uh, the expiration of a reasonable time of the offerer that is implied by law passes, if the expiration of a stated time for the uh, revoking of the offer passes, if there is a rejection by the offeree or a counteroffer by the offeree, or at some point there becomes a lack of capacity of the offerer. And the offeree must have knowledge of an offer. Acceptance cannot be the result of coincidence. As a general rule, but subject to the exception under methods of acceptance, an offeree cannot alter, delete, or add terms to a contract when accepting. The contract must be accepted or rejected as is. And it's important to note that contract law, especially sales contracts for goods, are governed by the Uniform Commercial Code, which is an important series of law regarding commercial transactions that has been adopted at least in part by all states. This code governs the various practices of sales and financing by commercial businesses with one another and the general public. And under the Article 2, there are various provisions allowing for when an offer is accepted. The last element that we need to discuss for a valid contract to be shown is consideration, which is the benefit received by a party in exchange for the party's promise or performance. And to break this down a little further, if the person promises or does something he or she or is not obligated to do in exchange for a promise or performance that he or she is not otherwise entitled to receive. 
and the value of the consideration for the specific contract must be determinable in terms of value, quantity, and quality. Consideration, however, cannot be something that is illegal or would force the party to engage in illegal conduct, and consideration must be something that is genuine as represented. Moving on, I'd like to discuss third-party involvement in contracts. There are three types of third-party contracts that you should be aware of. The third party in these types of contracts are, are segregated into different categories. These are donee beneficiaries, creditor beneficiaries, and incidental beneficiaries. The donee beneficiary receives benefit from the contract as a gift from one of the promisors. The creditor beneficiary receives benefit from one promisor as satisfaction of an existing debt from the other promisor. And the incidental beneficiary is not intended by the parties to benefit directly from the contract, but receives a benefit as a side effect of the contract. A donee or creditor beneficiary can enforce the contract against the party obligated to provide the benefit. The incidental beneficiary, on the other hand, has no rights against either party to the contract because there was no intent to make the contract for the purpose of benefiting this party. And to conclude our discussion of contracts, we will end with a discussion of assignment and delegation. Assignment and delegation takes place when one or more parties to a contract assign rights or delegate duties under the contract to a third party. Generally, assignment or delegation is acceptable unless a. the parties have stipulated in the contract that it is not permissible or b. the assignment or delegation would significantly alter the duty or rights of the other party to the contract. In assignment, a party assigns the rights or benefits that he or she is entitled to receive under the terms of the contract. The party to the contract is known as the assigner and the party receiving these rights is the assignee. To delegate one's duties under a contract, the person accepting the duties, the delegatee, must be able to provide equivalent performance. In addition, the party delegating the duties, delegator, remains responsible under the contract until the duties are performed satisfactorily by the delegate. And with that discussion, we complete our analysis of contracts law and the material in Chapter 13 of the text. However, it should be noted that even if we establish all of these elements that we discussed in great detail at the beginning of this lecture, there are various defenses to a contract, such as unconscionability, adhesion contracts, or fraud in fact, or fraud in the inducement. You should be aware of the elements of all these defenses as they are an excellent way to test your knowledge of this material as they require you first to establish that the elements of a valid contract have been shown and then that nonetheless the contract cannot be informed because one of these defenses does exist. Now we will discuss the law governing businesses and more specifically the law governing business organizations. The first principle that you need to be aware of is the principle of agency. An agency is a relationship in which one party acts for another or represents another by the latter's authority. And there are two parties to this relationship. There's the principle. The principle gives authority to another to act in his or her behalf. And there's the agent who receives the authority to act on behalf of another. The principal must have legal or contractual capacity to authorize the agency relationship. However, it is not necessary for an agent to have contractual authority because it is the principal who is contractually bound to third parties by the actions of the agents. Most jurisdictions impose minimal levels of competence for an agent. Generally, persons who are virtually total deficient in mental ability will not be considered part of a valid principal-agent relationship. This uh, relationship is very important because it creates various duties and obligations on both parties. The agent, for example, has fiduciary duties towards the principal, and these include duties to act with reasonable care to protect the assets and interests of the principal, and a duty of obedience to accomplish the goals of the principal in the agency relationship. If an agent breaches a duty owed to the principal, then several things may occur. 
The responsibility of the principal to be bound to third parties by the agent's acts may be affected. The principal may have an action at law against the agent to recover any damage suffered as a result of the breach. If the agent was paid for the services rendered, then the principal may sue for damages incurred directly as a result of the breach of one or more duties. The principal may sue the agent in tort for breach of the reasonable care of property or the failure to make reasonable efforts to accomplish the purposes of the agency, or if the agent breaches the fiduciary duty and profits from dealing on his or her behalf rather than on behalf of the principal, then the principal may recover all the profits accumulated through the agent's self-dealing. This last one is known as the remedy of disgorgement. On the other hand, the agent is entitled to several benefits as a result of this relationship. These include reimbursement for reasonable expenses incurred in pursuing the objective of the agency, cooperation in the completion of the assigned tasks, and, unless the agent has agreed to act gratuitously, every principal owes an agent a duty of reasonable compensation for services performed on behalf of the principal. However, there is an exception to this duty of compensation and reimbursement toward the agent when there is a loss incurred through the fault of the agent. And if the principal fails or refuses to honor any of these duties, then the agent is either entitled to bring an action at law against the principal for breach of contract, or impose a possessory lien on the property of the principal that the agent holds, or both. And we should be note that there are various types of authority that characterize this relationship. In if there is actual authority, the principal and the agent must both speak or act in a way that manifests an agreement to the relationship, and the principal must have legal capacity. In actual express, which is a subcategory of actual authority, the principal gives the agent an overt verbal or written communication stating the nature of the authority, and if no limits are placed on the agent, and a question arises as to whether the agent exceeded the authority, the court will limit the authority to what would be usual and customary under the circumstances. Authority can also be implied. In this case, the principal acts in such a way that the agent reasonably believes that it has the authority to act for the principal that has been granted. There is also implied authority by acquiescence, and this is where the principal has not given an agent the express authority to do certain acts on behalf of the principals, but the principal does not interfere or object and accepts the benefit that results from this exercise of implied authority by acquiescence. And finally, apparent authority is if the principal acts in such a way that third parties reasonably believe that an agency relationship exists, then third parties can rely on and deal with the agent, and the principal will be bound by such dealings. It's important to note that there isn't actual authority here to act on behalf of the principal. It's just that the principal's actions are such that third parties reasonably rely on this relationship existing, and so they will not be punished in this situation. Finally, authority may be created by ratification. Where this happens, where no agency relationship exists, but the principal may approve of the benefit flowing from the acts of the purported agent and thus ratifies the action taken by the agent, creating a agency relationship after the fact. Additionally, you should be aware of the doctrine of respondeat superior. We talked about this a little bit in our material under tort law. And basically this doctrine holds that an agent, torts, can be imputed to the principal under this doctrine if they happen in the ordinary course of business. Intentional torts are normally immune from this treatment. However, if in the course of business an employee commits a tort, the employer or the principal may be held liable. Moving on, it is time to discuss the law governing business organizations. And the reason we start this analysis with a discussion of agency principles is because in all of these organizations, there are typically agent-principal relationships, and these principles will govern how the agents and principals will be treated. So the first type of organization I want to discuss is the partnership. First, a partnership is defined as a voluntary contract between two or more competent persons to place their resources or their understanding that there shall be a proportional sharing of the profits and losses. And there is a Uniform Partnership Act, which is a model law adopted by a majority of states, 
that outlines procedures for the creation, operation, and termination of partnership. Most of the specific laws that we discuss will be derived from this Uniform Partnership Act. And here, the characteristics of a partnership is that each partner is an agent of the partnership and represents the other partners. A partner's personal assets are not protected from being applied to pay the debts of the business. This is one of the biggest failings of the partnership in that there is unlimited personal liability for partnership debts, which means that if a creditor has a valid claim against the partnership, they can seek to get redress for this claim against not only the assets of the partnership, but of the personal assets of each partner. Liability for debts of the partnership is joint and several among the partners. If one partner is required to satisfy a large portion of the debt, then the other partners are required to reimburse a share of the payment that was made, assuming they have the financial ability to reimburse that share of the debt. And generally, partner share profit and losses equally. And the partnership is required to file tax returns for record keeping purposes only. And some states require that the name of the partnerships, as well as the name of the partners, be included in any litigation. A partner is not entitled to payment for services rendered as an employee, but is only entitled to a share of profits or losses, as are the other partner, except in winding up and ending business. And partners are fiduciaries toward the partnership and to one another. It's important to note that one of the good advantages, though, of a partnership is the tax treatment. Corporations have double treatment of taxation, which means that corporate profits are taxed not only at the corporate level, but then also taxes individual income when distributed as dividends or through other manners. Whereas in a partnership, the partnership is not individually taxed. Rather, any profits that go to the personal income of each partner is only taxed once. The principle of limited liability and this taxation principle are some of the most important factors in determining which form a business should take, whether that be a partnership, which has unlimited personal liability for partnership debts, but better tax treatment, a corporation, which has limited liability of the, equal to the investment of each uh, investor or shareholder in the concern, or, for example, a hybrid form, such as a limited liability company or an LLC, which also has the beneficial tax treatment of a partnership, but has the limited liability of a corporation. The only real downside to this form is that the law governing these is not quite as developed as corporations, and thus investors may be, feel less secure in investing in a limited liability company in some situations. Moving on, it is important that you be aware of how some of these hybrid forms such as limited liability companies, limited liability partnerships, limited partnerships, and other such forms manage these two uh, situations of limited liability and tax treatment. However, the last form that I want to discuss in greater de detail and conclude our discussion of the Chapter 14 material and the Week 7 lecture is corporations. This is probably the most significant and pervasive business form currently existent. Legal advantages make the corporation one of the most common forms of business. Because a corporation is created purely by statute, the legislatures have been free to create different subtypes of corporations to suit the different needs of businesses. And most corporations share standard characteristics. The first concept that you need to be aware of here is legal person. A corporation is recognized in a person, as a person in legal terms. It can therefore be taxed and held responsible for its acts for the purposes of lawsuits. Statutes even permit corporations and their agents to be convicted of criminal acts and subject to penalties, although not imprisonment, because obviously the corporation is a legal fiction. Additionally, the acting individuals can be held criminally responsible. Unlike a partnership, that end with change in ownership, a corporation goes on indefinitely as long as the requirements of the statutes that permitted its creation and maintenance are met. And to discuss the doctrine of limited liability a little further, a person who invests in a corporation is known as a shareholder. 
In return for his or her investment, a shareholder is given shares of stock in the corporation to represent a percentage of ownership. If the corporation does well, then the shareholder's ownership becomes more valuable in the terms of the price of the shares or the distribution of profits. If the corporation does badly, or a large monetary judgment is rendered against it as the result of a lawsuit, then the shareholders usually stand to lose only the amount of the original investment. One of the important doctrines governing corporation, however, is the uh, conflict between ownership and control. When a corporation is created, a board of directors is appointed that oversees the general operation of the corporation and the officers of the corporation who supervise the day-to-day -day activities. This method of separating management from ownership protects the interests of shareholders who are not involved in management. It is not necessary for members of the board of directors or the officers to have any ownership interest in the corporation. So although the shareholders own the corporation, Control of the corporation is ordinarily vested in the board of directors and the board of directors appointed officers. The corporation is created by promoters, and the primary duty of a promoter is to obtain sufficient funding or capitalization of the corporation to ensure that all the formalities required by statute for incorporation are satisfied. Some jurisdictions, promoters are personally liable for the contracts they make on behalf of the corporation unless and until the corporation agrees to substitute itself for the promoter in the contract. This is known as a novation. If more than one promoter is involved in forming a corporation, then each has a fiduciary duty to the other and cannot act in his or her own self-interest if it will harm the interests of the other promoters. And promoters have a fiduciary duty to the corporation and its shareholders. If a promoter fully discloses information of a possible conflict of interest to the corporation and the corporation or interested shareholders who would be affected approve, then the promoter may use this information to take advantage of the opportunity. And to create this corporation, uh, the procedures are set by statutes, and all states have some type of statutory law that governs the creation, operation, and dissolution of corporate entities. And the last doctrine I want to talk to you in connection with this material it involves piercing the corporate veil. Piercing the corporate veil is a way that courts will hold shareholders of the corporation personally liable for debts and validating the ordinary limited liability. And to do, use this doctrine, it must be shown that there are several elements existing. So, a corporation may be subject to piercing of the corporate veil in three instances. One, when it is necessary to prevent fraud. That is, when it can be shown the corporation was formed in a direct attempt to avoid legal obligations to creditors or others with legal rights. Two, when there is inadequate capitalization, the original corporate structure must provide for investment that is adequate to show the corporate purpose to be achieved or there may be evidence that indicates there was never a true intent to form a legal corporation for the purpose of doing legitimate business. And three, when the corporation refuses to recognize the formalities necessary to a de jure corporation, either the statutory requirements are ignored, or a corporation is created to act as a shell to protect a different corporation that actually controls the shell corporation. This final theory is known as the alter ego theory. And with that, we have finished the week seven lecture, and I'll see you next week.